Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting, Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Yet. Uh, pursuant to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104, the board will meet in closed session to discuss performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, to consider matters related to negotiations, and to perform administrative function. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote of the motion to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We'll see you at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County Open a Meeting on Wednesday, 5th, August 5th, 2020. Uh, could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have a few housekeeping items. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I moved. Second. I have a second. Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from July 1st, open and closed? July 8th, executive closed? July 22nd, open and closed? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept July 1st, open and closed. July 8th, executive closed. July 22nd, open and closed. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all. Next item is our board and staff involvement. Board members? Captain Kelly? I, um, I attended a, a virtual um, MABE uh, legislative committee meeting. And I just wanted to fill everyone in. It was there was a lot of discussion on what the um, the other uh, school systems are going to do for going back to school. Um, there were about 15 of the 24 reported in there, all going back virtual. Um, the first, uh, at least the first quarter, some the first semester, but quite a few are going to attempt to go um, some kind of a hybrid the second quarter. Um, and so they are, everyone's facing the same kind of problems uh, that we all are, because uh, we're all in Maryland, <laughs> apparently. So um, I just want to bring that up. The other thing that is legislative, it's important for the board to understand and really for the public to understand, is that um, I know, um, based on all the input I've received from parents, there's quite a few of them that are going to send their, student, their students to private schools or they're gonna homeschool, or they're gonna do pod, pod schooling, and they're not gonna come back to our system. Um, one group said they were a mom's group or something. There were like 50 students they were pulling out of our system. I only say that because, as we all know, September 30th is the student count. We do a count of how many students we have in our school system. And that is the number of students that we base our maintenance of effort on for next year's funding. And so if there's 50 students, superintendent formula, and that our, our amount for per student is about $7,700, that's about a $365,000 reduction in just the basic MOE, which is ordinarily what the, the uh, commissioners give us. So if there's larger numbers, then we will be short quite a bit of money on top of other um, things we're going to be missing next next year's on uh, next year's budget. So it's important to understand for the parents that if you had an if you had an, an a desire to pull your students out for one year and then bring them back into the system, we will be have quite a lot of less lot less money because of that. Not and I know you don't it, it matters because that will Im highly impact our ability to have small class sizes, um, to have the strongest um, uh, staff that, because we wouldn't be able to give any um, raises to the staff. So it's a big impact. So if we don't have a high count September 30th this year, it's pretty much two years before we can go back to the budget that we would, we would hope for, at least where we are right now. 
So I think it's going to be a bad impact, and it was brought up at my, my legislative meeting. They did say that we're, they're talking, Mabe is talking about somehow pushing forward to have some kind of legislation that would freeze, potentially freeze that, um, what we have MOE this year. And I just wanted Mr. Fister to understand that too. And I, I heard the CFOs have all been talking about that too, what it's gonna impact us on uh, our budgets uh, if people do not come back. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other board members? Dr. Kane? Um, thank you. Just in response to, to what you said, Captain Kelly, the superintendent groups, we also uh, worked with Dr. Salmon to find out if we could push that September 30th date back because sometimes families will decide, you know, initially I'm not going to bring my child and then they'll decide later, okay, I'm going to bring them back. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that because it is in Comar. It is in state regulation. So we weren't able to get that date mm -mm, pushed back. So as far as um, events, of course, I had my regular meetings for this past month, meetings with PAZAM, the state superintendent group, and, and ESMIC, the Eastern Shore superintendent group. Uh, and I mentioned last time that I am now sitting on a committee uh, a study on um, black boys with the State Department. And Dr. Vermel Green, state board member, is leading that. And we certainly met for that and we'll continue to meet throughout the rest of the school year and, and hopefully be able to bring some good recommendations forward to the State Department on ways that we can better address the needs of black boys in our state. Um, I'm also uh, happy to say that my um, keynote address to the um, the Beatles uh, Environmental and Bay, um, Bay Science Environmental Group in uh, University of California, Berkeley went quite well, overwhelmingly well. And I've been invited to sit on a panel at the end of the month for environmental education pertaining specifically to elementary. So uh, happy to continue to move forward with that. Met with my Mayo board, that's the Maryland Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education. We had a full day uh, sort of retreat uh, planning meeting and that was very, very successful. We also focused on social justice and equity and diversity for that, uh, that meeting. So a very, very good uh, month and looking forward to more to come. Great. Um, Mr. Pluski's not here. Did he give you a... He, Mr. Pluski did his regular meetings as well. He meets with the State Department. We've also met with um, portions of Tiger teams and principals. We just met yesterday with middle school and elementary principals. We still have yet to meet with the high school principals. We're still um, planning to have our Leadership Institute on next week. So we're full throttle, moving ahead. That's great. Thank you so much. And the next one, you want to go ahead and take student members? A absolutely. So first and foremost, we'd like to welcome our new student board members. We have with us, uh, and, and they don't have microphones, so I'm going to have to speak for them, Natalie Smith, and we have Ms. Alexis Gross. Both of them participated in their training today for student board members, and they look like they're smiling and happy. I don't know if the cameras can see them ready to go. Uh, Ms. Gross, you are from Ken Island, Ken Island High School, and Ms. Smith, you are from? Queen Anne's County High School, and they'll be presenting to us information from their schools as the year goes on. I'd like to ask you, ladies, if you would like to one by one come forward, if you have um, anything that you would like to say. I don't want to put you on the spot, but we certainly want to welcome you. We so look forward to working with you, particularly as, as we embark on this uh, starting the year virtually. We certainly want to hear from you. Don't want to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to say anything, you're welcome to do so. There's microphones are up here, ladies. You just come on up if you'd like. That looks like a no. Don't don't <laughs> worry. Don't worry. That's It'll, okay. You'll, you'll, have, to you'll have plenty of time. <laughs> don't worry. But we are so glad that you were able to come tonight. So welcome. Appreciate it. Looking forward to working with you. Okay. We have public comment. Okay. Um, we've received various letters on issues regarding comments to this board. And I'd like to have the public comment back on our September 2nd meeting. We can post on our website on how we can do social distancing and screening. And I feel it's important for the citizens to express their comments directly to this board. So I'd like to ask to go back on September the 2nd to have comments to be presented to this board. And then we can address at that time that people can address us. We can put the protocol on the website. 
put the protocol on, um, you know, how we'll do social distancing and, and what we'll have to do to have people check in like we do. I think you have pro protocol now to come into the board office. We have protocol to come into the board office. So are you suggesting, Mr. Smith, that the comments, the many, many comments that we have received from the community not be read tonight as the, the uh, citizens have requested? Um, I've got, I've seen, I, hopefully all of them. Some of them are directly been asked to be read. Some of them have just been comments to us. I am not as one gonna pick and choose that and decide who does and who d does. Um, people are very passionate on some issues we have going on right now. And I think it would serve the community and this board well, if they would like to come and speak to us. And like we always say in a civil manner, we're not gonna address personnel issues, but in a civil manner and let's have some, you know, comments and I think it would be better for people to come and express it to us rather than us reading separate letters and either misrepresent a word or comment in a, something that was just not right. I just think it's better to have public comment and I think we're at the point now where we can have them come in here on September the 2nd. Anybody feel free to come in and we should post it on our website on what we'll do so they feel comfortable doing it. So um, if, if I may. In response to multiple emails and letters the Board of Education members have received in recent weeks, we want to ensure the public that we recognize and appreciate Dr. Kane's efforts to bring awareness and discussion to the issue of the marginalization of minority populations. Providing social awareness is an important component of public school education. Our focus should always be on inclusion, not exclusion. We should educate our students on all social injustices, and this certainly includes the history of injustices against black and brown people in America. Bigotry and bias in any form should not be tolerated nor explained away. It is our responsibility as a community to stress the importance that all people deserve empathy, understanding, civility, and respect, regardless of, but not limited to, ideology, age, ability, religion, socioeconomic background, family structure, race, nationality, gender, and gender identification. Students need to be encouraged to have open and meaningful dialogue with their parents, peers, teachers, religious leaders, and community members about social issues and their thoughts and feelings and concerns about them. We look forward to working with everyone to help remove bigotry and bias from our lives and to promote a safe and supportive, respectful community for years to come. I do have a comment that I'm going to read. It is, first of all, this is not part of my comment, but it is hugely disappointing that the board has decided that they will not read the comments that were submitted. And some of them have been submitted for a few weeks now. But I'll read mine. In light of the recent attacks on my character and leadership by some members of the Queen Anne's County community, I'm compelled to respond. My letter to the community dated June the 5th spawned a firestorm of racist, hate-filled backlash for which I was completely caught off guard. In my communication among other school district news, I spoke of the undeniable police brutality and racism that exists in our country, our state, our county, and our schools. I spoke of my support for the Black Lives Matter mo movement and my concern as a mother of two black sons. I spoke about black and white people coming together in nonviolent protests against the mistreatment of and discrimination against black people and people of color. I went on to share some suggestions for how we might begin to talk about these injustices with our, with our children. In my letter and right now, I still believe that we should listen more and pass judgment less be slow to anger, and extend grace to one another generously. There are people in this community that are absolutely incensed that I, a black woman, am here and in a leadership position. Some have written the county's elected officials, some have written the Maryland Department of Education, and many have written school board members calling for me to be fired because I spoke up about racism the ugly racism that rears its head in Queen Anne's County and in our schools. They're angry because I shared an opportunity for students to talk about race. They viciously attacked a leader of that venue who has a long history of advocating for and supporting students of all ethnicities. Unfortunately, others in our community also became prey for this group. 
I'm going to call these acts of ignorant, ignorance out for exactly what they are, racism. This divisiveness that Queen Anne's County is experiencing is about race. It's about my race. It's about racism and any effort that I make or plan to make to address it. At a time when school districts across the state and country are putting plans in motion to support students and work with their community to acknowledge the injustices, seek understanding and reconcile, Queen Anne's County is divided with some who refuse to acknowledge their experiences. And because they can't see, they can't see them, they think that they have never existed. It takes a pretty hardened heart to stand square footed in denial of another person's pain just because they haven't experienced it. Superintendents and school boards across our state, Montgomery, Howard, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's, Anne Arundel, Caroline, Wicomico, Talbot, and others have addressed the issue of racism publicly just as I have done these districts have vowed to unite with their communities to ensure that racism and inequity is addressed. The Montgomery County School Board states that they will not tolerate their students feeling unsafe in their skin. The Board of Education in Baltimore County unanimously approved a resolution proposed by a student board member that among other things deals with justice, equity, and valuing black students states that schools will facilitate courageous conversations concerning systemic racism, social justice, racial and ethnic bias, and work toward a unified effort for communities and schools to come together for all of their children. The superintendent in Anne Arundel County wrote an op-ed for, for the Capital Gazette newspaper entitled, This Time We Must Heed the Alarm on White Privilege. The state superintendent and elected officials outside of Queen Anne's County have publicly affirmed their commitment to anti-racist efforts in schools and in our communities. I'd like to thank Ms. Christine um, Betley, our, um, who really did a great job in compiling statements made by our business partners affirming their support for the Black Lives Matter movement and other anti-racist efforts. Queen Anne's County and Queen Anne's County Public Schools should not be exempt from acknowledging injustices toward black people and other people of color and committing to do all that can be done to lessen its impact on students. With such small percentages of students of color here in Queen Anne's County, the isolation and impact caused by racism is amplified. I know this firsthand. To be clear, I will not stop speaking out about issues of racism, injustices, or equity as they concern the students of Queen Anne's County or elsewhere. There are times when a leader must stand alone. Thankfully, I now know that this is not one of those times. Just as there is a petition circulating with over 500 signatures to have me fired because I spoke out, there is also a petition with over 3,300 signatures to support me in my efforts to call attention to racism and to engage students in conversations about race. I thank my family, my friends, the numerous employees, parents, students, faith-based community, New United Methodist Church, the environmental education community, Apostle Craig Coates of Fresh Start Church, the Sunday Supper Committee, the Queen Anne's County Equity Commission uh, Committee, the Queen Anne's County NAACP, our Teachers of the Year, various other community leaders, and my awesome neighbors who have supported me, checked on my well being, and risked public ridicule and continued attacks by putting themselves out there to speak up for me, my leadership, what is right, just, and humane. I thank those who've been so courageous to tell the truth about racism and call it out for what it is. I pray that this community can find a path to awareness, understanding, and reconciliation. But if the adults can't do that, my hope is that we can step to the side 
and allow the children to lead the way because they are ready. There are numerous emails and communications from people that are not uh, um, in a position to be at a board meeting. Um, they had no advance notice that their comments would not be read. And it is, um, it is quite unfortunate that that decision was made. I wasn't with my knowledge. I had no idea that that decision was gonna be announced tonight. As the community can see, I have stacks of comments from supporters and those who believe that students should have the opportunity to talk about race and should be able to be educated in an environment that supports them regardless of their color. So I wanna thank all of those people who supported me. If you are unable to attend the next board meeting as proposed tonight, please write again and ask that your comments be read at that time. You have a right to be heard whether you can be here or not. So I wanna thank you all for that. Thank you. The only thing I, I would like to say is I hope, and I know this board does, wanna be part of the solution and not the problem. And we have issues, but they can be worked out. And this thing that I propose tonight is I think we need to get back for people to address this board directly. And I think it'd be in the best interest of this county and this school system if we do that. And I still stand by that. And it's not trying to quiet, quiet anybody. Everybody's free to come here and say it. If they can't, then it, and there's a, people that can't, we can look at another way of possibly doing something. But it is very disheartening to hear people, some of the comments, and I am not gonna sit here and prejudge people on what to say and what not to say. I think they need to speak it themselves. We also had questions and comments about the reopening of schools, which will be addressed on the August 19th board meeting, from what I understand. I have, I have, I don't control who, when, you know, you do public comment. No, I, just what some of the other public comment was about, was about the opening of schools and they had questions and, and concerns and hopefully we'll be able to address all those at the August 19th work session. If you are saying that you're gonna be reading their comments, then. No, I wasn't going to, because they, I know that they're, what they're, was going to be con was going to be addressed on August 19th. I'm just putting it out there so everyone knows that we will be addressing their issues. Okay. The current action items, human resources and sub bus driver report. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the human resources and bus driver report as presented in closed session? So I moved. think we still have Ms. Fields who would like to make a comment. Oh, I apologize. Yes. Ms. Fields, please come on up. I apologize. Um, I found out when I arrived that we weren't signing the contract tonight. So um, I had also asked that I be able to speak. So I appreciate you allowing me to do that. And before I read my statements, um, Dr. Kane, I want you to know that Queen Anne County Education Association is fully behind your efforts. We have posted statements on Facebook and on our QA CEA website. We too have teachers that have come under attack. Um, as an educator, I would be delinquent if I didn't stand up for all of my students and if I didn't think that communication was the key to knowledge. But until we do acknowledge that we have a problem, we are never going to solve it. Thank you, Ms. Fields. So, <clears throat> for the record, I, Ms. Fields, would you state your name and your? Oh, Thank sorry. You. Karen Fields, sixth grade teacher, Centerville Middle School, president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. Thank you. So, um, we appreciate the consideration that the Board of Education has given to the health and safety of our members, staff, students, and the community in making the decision to begin school the school year virtually. Um, I reached out early on to Dr. Kane and to Mr. Paluski about being a part of the decision-making process. Uh, Mr. Paluski agreed and my leadership team was a part of all of those Tiger teams. So I wanted people to be aware of that because often we're seen as adversaries and we're really not, we're advocates. Um, we advocate for our students. So in that light of being an advocate, I wanted to say, <clears throat> in 
It is the position of the Queen Anne's County Education Association that teachers and support staff during this virtual semester should be given the choice to work from home or from their classroom. This will protect those with pre-existing conditions or those that have vulnerable family members in their home. Educators and support staff may also have childcare issues that would, allevi would be alleviated to a certain extent with this type of flexibility. Staff should not be pressured to return to their buildings or engage in activities that put themselves and their families at risk, such as mandatory attendance at school-based community fairs or working with age-appropriate students that refuse to wear masks. Protocols must be in place that delineate the steps to be taken when health and safety guidelines are not followed. We also urge that these protocols be countywide and not under the purview of individual principals, as was the case during some activities in the summer. While the CARES Act does provide compensation for educators that have pre-existing conditions, it takes the expertise and the experience of the educator out of the virtual classroom where it is needed the most. Having a choice to work from home will help to ensure that there will be quality continuity of learning for all of our students. We are confident that collaboration, planning, explicit instruction, lively discussion, relevant feedback, and reflection will remain a vital part of a successful, <clears throat> successful teaching no matter where the computer sits. The student experience would not be affected whether virtual instruction is delivered from our classrooms or from our homes. And I also wanted to say, I, I know for a fact that teachers right now are working diligently to deliver the same sort of instruction that we give throughout the year virtually. So I really have a lot of confidence that it's going to be delivered as professionals. And um, I would urge people to take advantage of that because um, we are already tooling up. We're ready for it. So um, thank you for continuing to make the safety of all our community a priority. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you thank very you. much. So Ms. Fields, is it okay if you go ahead and sign them and then I'll, I'll sign them on August 19th yes. so you don't have to come back? Yes. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And I will email this to you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, current action items, human resource and subdriver bus report. Do I have a motion to accept the report as presented in closed session? So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion, the human resources report as presented in closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. New bus purchases, sir. I'm sorry. You want me to wipe down the... <coughs> Good evening, board members, Dr. King. Uh, for the record, my name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer, and I'm seeking approval tonight for um, allowing Ms. Joanne Schaefer to replace bus 1106 and Erica Willis to replace bus 5306. Both of those buses uh, will have met their 15-year life uh, that is allowed by Comar. Um, it used to be, as you know, about five years ago, 12, and it was extended to 15. So those two buses need to be replaced um, this year. And so I'm seeking uh, approval to have those two buses replaced tonight. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the uh, new bus purchases as described by Mr. Pinder? So moved. I have a second. Second. Questions, comments, discussion? A questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, what is the expense for each bus? So the PVA, the current PVA is uh, a little over $19,000 okay. for a bus. So depending on when you go back, again, 15 years ago, it may be about a $7,000 or so increase um, for that. And we do budget for that increase. Um, we try to look ahead in years to make sure that the amount of buses that need to be replaced are allocated within there. And the other bus? Same thing, sir. So, uh, and these were in the approved capital budget. 
No, this this is in the operating budget. It comes for the through the PVA. Why is it the, in the, the operating budget if we're buying a, a capital equipment that no, lasts no. 15 years? These are contracted buses, contracted oh. bus drivers. We're giving them approval to purchase these to replace the, the two 15-year-old buses they have. And then with that, they get a new PVA, which is how the bus is paid for. So it is in operating co costs because yes. it's a recurring cost. I understand why it's an operating cost. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the boat motion to accept the new bus purchases as described by Mr. Pinder. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, next item is textbooks for adoption. Uh, LA grade eight novel Coraline. Do we have any? There were no comments. So tonight is a uh, call for a vote. Correct. Okay. And, um, and yeah. since people can't come in, we've had that out on our website so people could review it correct. if they wanted to. That is correct. So let me make the motion so we can ask any other questions. Do I have a uh, motion to ex accept the middle school ELA 8 novel Coraline? Fiscal impact, uh, $3,201.60. Budget source, Striving Readers, Comprehensive Literary Grant, Year 3. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions, comments on the motion? Discussion? Do we need a discussion? All right, everyone okay? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the middle school ELA 8 novel Coraline. Fiscal impact $3,201.60. Budget source, striving readers, comprehensive literary grant year three. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Next item on the agenda, the policy uh, for second read. Uh, employee travel 315 and regulation employee travel 315.1. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Fister. How are you? How are you doing? Uh, for the record, John Fister, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, in front of you tonight for second uh, read uh, is the employee travel policy. Uh, it's really the first one that we're putting in place here in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. There have been no comments in the last, uh, since the last board meeting from first reading to second reading, but I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. have is this mirror what the uh, county does as well? I have not looked at at, the, oh, okay. at what the county does. Um, this mirrors a lot of the counties that I've been in and a lot of typical public school systems. I mean, it mirrors it from the IRS standpoint, um, but as far as some of the specifics, um, it, it really pertains to Queen Anne's County Public Schools, not the county government. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I think, excuse me, the, the question was not that they're related other than the fact that somebody working for one side and the other side could compare them to see which one is better. Well, we, like I said, the, the reimbursement rate is, is strictly the IRS rate. So that's going to be the same. Um, IRS regulates um, commuting mileage versus, you know, like working from home and things like that. So those things are in alignment. Yeah. Okay. No, no further questions. Okay. So uh, do I have a motion to second to send out for a second reading uh, policy title employee travel 315 regulation title employee travel 3.15? So moved. I have a second. Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to put out for a second read policy title employee travel 315 and regulation title employee travel 315.1. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Appreciate it. Next on our agenda is the Queen Anne's County Board of Education Appeals and Hearing Guide. So, what we're doing with that? <clears throat> I believe the um, Mr. Um, Burns was going to look through this, and Mrs. Wright, you sent it to Mr. Burns, right? I suggested that we put it on the agenda. 
that was at his request. To, to finalize Tonight, the vote yes. on this? He was okay with the rewrite? That yes. Was, mm -hmm. Okay. The most significant part we had was, was clarifying the uh, days, what days for all of these events. And it was a lot of confusion in the last one. Of the start day, the start day and then when did the clock started ticking as far as that goes? Yes. Right, and, and there's so many steps in it for the appeal process mm -hmm. that involve days. And we had calendar days here. We had holidays. You know, and I think we, then we, just go, school days. Then we went back to school days. I'm, I'm yes. Right. Yeah, I'm looking at the revisions, and that's exactly where it, it goes back to school days, mm -hmm. right? For not calendar days. So, uh, so a, a week, a school week would be five, a month would be twenty, or whatever. Yes, we did by days because it also you had holidays mixed into some of those weeks, so we couldn't say weeks. And I tried to work with these with Mrs. Wright, and it was pretty pretty hard. Mrs. Wright, are you happy with the rewrite? Because you're the one who works with it the most. And so, do I have a, a motion to accept? The Queen Anne's County Board of Education <coughs> Appeals and Hearing Guide. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the Queen Anne's County Board of Education Appeals and Hearing Guide. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Uh, next on our agenda is the transfer notice. Mr. Pfister, I, I see there isn't any. Okay. That was just informational. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Uh, we are down to uh, future school board meetings. August 19th, the school work board session. Um, as I understand, we'll be talking about what's sent over to MSDE. On August 14th? August 14th, it will be posted on our website, and MSDE will retrieve uh, recovery plans from all school districts' websites on that day. So we'll be beginning a presentation on the recovery plan? On so you've had a presentation on the recovery plan? We're happy to um, just go over it again. Nothing has changed since you approved it. Um, I, I do have me. a couple of questions on it. On it. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I give way to the lady. Well, we... Um, there has been still been quite a few questions on, I mean, there was questions on the opening of schools. And so there's a lot of details that had to be worked out. And so that's why the 19th would be good to know because a couple of weeks later, schools open. So that's why I would, was asking for some kind of a briefing. We can do it the 19th, like you told me we would. Right, but we do a uh, back to school, a readiness for the opening of schools right before school every year. And we'll continue to do that. So we will have that report. And that will, just like it always does, include how we open schools and, and everything that parents need to know that we've prepared for in order to open schools successfully. So there's a couple things I wonder if we could get information on, and then they, I believe they're working on these things. I'm not sure. Um, but there's a couple concerns the public had that I've been getting emails on, um, and you may not know the answers to them. That's why I was hoping to have an update, but I could ask a couple now. Um, the the connectivity disruption is is a, an issue and uh, they are wondering parents are wondering if the the lessons are going to be recorded so that the students can go back to get them if their internet goes out yes they absolutely will so we'll be recording lessons and we'll have live lessons so parents can go back and retrieve those uh, those lessons. Okay. Another one was we were recently informed that all student laptops must be logged into the network in order to maintain Windows activation. I don't know if you're aware of that. If there's um, anything that we need for students to do with their laptops, just like always, we will push that out to them so that they can do it and whatever update needs to happen with that device. They did happen. get it. What they got was that we all got a notice from the uh, principal that it, the windows will be deactivated after 180 days of not logging into the network. Um, and that login can only happen on campus. So I wanted to know if there was a way that Mr. Coombs or someone could look at uh, the, the activation expires on September 8th. Um, so if there's any way that we could contact Microsoft and see if we can override the deactivation or something like that, because not all families will be making a special trip to the high schools to get the, these updated. And I don't know if it pertains to all of them. This was a note from the high schools. 
So there's a concern about that. So someone could look into that. Um, another one is the questions on uh, electives. Um, the, la the labs, have they been working through the electives? Because there's a lot of things that have to be in person, like ceramics, labs, um, other things, uh, team sports, uh, weightlifting. There's, there's a lot of question on how that the students can actually do those electives. So the question is, are we, a lot of emails I've been getting, are we, are we omitting um, some of these that can't be done, that have to be done in person, or are the high schools and middle schools working them out? All right. So Mr. Paluski and I met with uh, elementary and middle school principals on yesterday. We still have yet to meet with high school principals. One of the things that we asked them to do was to identify those students, specific students that needed to come into the building. For high schools, it will certainly be in addition to special education needs and EL services, uh, those CTE and lab courses based on schedules. So whether it be ceramics or some other course that we would get the, um, those students from the the principals so that we can contact those parents and find out if they needed transportation. So we are working on that right now and um, and we will make sure that we get that information out to families. We'd have to communicate with them anyway because we need to know if they need transportation. Right, right. Okay. Because one of the big concerns was, you know, we, we were talking about accommodating CTE and so they wanted to bring up that there are lots of other things that, that need to be accommodated also. And I appreciate you uh, responding to those parents' needs mm -hmm. and, and really reading the questions that they had because that is a personal interest to you. It's unfortunate that we weren't able to read the comments from the rest of the, the public that wanted their questions and comments responded to. So thank you for doing that. Okay. A comment here? If I could, uh, the state uh, superintendent, Dr. Salmon, uh, issued, uh, I think a week, 10 days ago, uh, a 13 step qualification for any district that wants to provide face to face teaching, whether a hybrid, uh, I think she was speaking of the hybrid. Um, so we're not initially going to do that, so we have time to answer those, uh, whatever those steps are. One of them was of particular interest to me, was the comment on how the virtual teaching versus face-to-face -face has affected the gap. And I frankly am new to this, yeah. but I have an interest in that. And if in the preparation for answering that question for Dr. Salmon, if uh, the board could see, uh, you know, some three-year uh, calculation of the gaps up and down, uh, and in particular, during our virtual teaching at the end of the last quarter, uh, I think it would be of some interest to see it. I'm a, 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 a you know, very interested in that, and, uh, uh, love to do variance analysis. When the gap increases, what was going on? When it shrinks, what was going on? And it could be a matter of number of students, uh, it could be teacher changes, it could be things that could be avoided. Anyway, I just raised that sure. point. And so one thing that we do, Mr. Anderson, is at the start of each school year, we do some diagnostic assessments so that we can get a handle on where students are currently performing. That does give us some indication of what was lost, what learning was lost over the summer, some of that summer slide. Um, and in our case right now, because we had a whole court, a quarter out of school and doing virtual learning, um, last spring, we'll have some indication. We won't have the same data that we generally have because we didn't have the same assessments at the end of the school year last year that we normally do. But we'll be able to give you some indication of where our students are starting. If we were to use the hybrid, we're going to have to have some good data. And quite frankly, Best it, data available. Absolutely. And quite frankly, it really doesn't matter if you're doing a hybrid or not. If we're bringing students, small groups of students in the buildings, we have to follow those protocols. And besides, it's something we ought to be looking at uh, on a regular basis, uh, at least every quarter. Correct. And just we do. to see how things are going. We do. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, go ahead. No, one more thing. Um, as discussed during our meeting on July 22nd, 
the board told the public that if we receive new information from the CDC or any other source, we would revisit our decision to go all virtual the first semester. The day after our vote, the CDC came out with new guidelines specifically for opening schools. Therefore, I move that the board revisit the decision on October 7th meeting to see if we could move the cont continuity of learning into a hybrid model starting the second quarter, which is the first week in November. I'd, I'd second that. I have a motion and a second. Questions, comments, discussion? I um, see no reason to vote for this because if we keep bouncing back and forth between one issue, if we say November the 1st, we're going to do hybrid, somebody needs to tell me where three hundred dollars to $500,000 of bus expense is coming from. Then uh, we have to see what those 13 steps Dr. Salmon is talking about in order to protect not only uh, the students, but the staff and their parents and the community at large. Uh, Mr. Anderson, it's, it's that, just, the motion just, is just, I'm sorry, it, I just want to clarify, the motion is just to revisit it, to look at it and have those discussions. It's not to make any decisions right now. I That's apologize. All it I, think it, I, I, I apologize. I should have let Captain Kelly speak to her motion. I apologize. So. Yeah. That's, I wanted to clarify that um, because like two-thirds of the hundreds of emails we got uh, one did want two-thirds of the ones we got said they wanted some kind of in-person. Um, so I just wanted to, to let you know that I, instead of waiting until January to revisit, um, we, our motion last, year, last meeting on the 22nd sent the discussion it said we will be virtual, all virtual up until the end of the first semester. I think it's important with the changes as we promised the public, we would actually revisit it if we need it. I just want to revisit it and then have those discussions. We don't know what the situation will be. As a matter in of correction, Mr. Manderson. we did not promise. Uh, a member made that statement and I'm not sure that it was clear what those changes would need to be even if somebody generally said CDC, uh, they weren't specific in what changes had to be made. I'm still perplexed as to where we're getting the three hundred dollars to $500,000 to pay for bus transportation in the hybrid. I understand. That, and that's why I, I wanted to revisit it. I wanted to bring it up that we will be revisiting it. That's what my motion is about. Um, so that we don't just drop the whole thing until December to start looking at it so that I feel it's important that we continue to prepare to move in to the hybrid situation if the conditions warrant it. So if we revisit it in October, we can make a decision if things are better and we can pop right in to the hybrid on the beginning of November. So I want to make sure we didn't stop worrying or getting ready for this because there's a lot of steps to work to move toward that. Once school started, we want to continue in that vein in that we can come the first week of November, do something. I'm not saying we're doing it. I'm just saying I want to be sure we look at it at the beginning of October. Okay. Mr. Smith? I think we all agree that we'd like to have our students safely back in our schools. And the vote was not to start off and start off with the virtual learning. I see no reason, unless somebody can explain to me differently, why in October we couldn't look at it and do it if we could get back at a hybrid in, in uh, the end of the semester rather than um, for a quarter rather than a semester I think it would help our students we hear from our teachers they want to get back I think even Dr. Kane we must agree we need our students back safely as soon as possible and I, I just don't see it makes common sense to review this and we'll have to see as you've said many a time we get what you tell us today changes in two minutes so we don't know what's going to happen, but let's let's keep it on the table, look at it, review it, have the CDC, have our health department give us some advice, our school system, our, everybody that's involved that are stakeholders, but I think it does not hurt to look at this in October to see if we can get them back in school earlier if possible. Then in November, bring it up. Okay, Mr. Ernst. Ms. Morissette, do you have anything to say? 
No, I mean, I believe I brought up the topic of quarter versus semester last meeting, and that was addressed um, because of the grading issues. So, because of the what issues? I'm sorry. Grading. You've got high school grading on a semester where the other schools are doing quarters. It, it would, I believe. It yeah, that be was the conversation that we had. And so, you know, we have always committed to just follow and make sure that when we can get kids in, we get kids in. Um, so I don't have any problem with bringing this back up in October. If you feel more comfortable setting a date to, to bring it to the board, that's fine. If there are new occurrences at that point, then we will certainly add them to the mix. If there are not, then we will say so. If there are uh, concerns, and what I would do is I would have our high school principals or academic deans come before you so that they could talk about the differences between what's happening when students are not in school every day versus when they are. And we'll talk about it then. I, I, I am absolutely not opposed to, to doing that. There are some discrepancies that we'd have to work through um, if we do that, but it's, it's definitely something that should be discussed. And I think, and the only thing I think the October 7th date is important, we have September board meeting, we have October, that would be the one we'd ha have to get some information on if we were to make a decision for the first semester or first quarter. And it's it just a, it's a thing that who knows what we're going to know then. You know, you might have information prior to that that could almost put this to rest prior to this or not. And we'll get it as soon as you know it. But I think that September, October the 7th gives us a just a, a date where everybody can say, yeah, we're going to review this again. And we'll, we'll review it all the time. I'm sure every day you're <laughs> looking at stuff like this. And that's what we have to keep doing to be due diligence. So I highly recommend we support this. The you, Talbot County is Thank going you. to try a virtual, and let's see what happens with Talbot County. You know, that they'll be starting school with some form of hybrid if, in fact, Dr. Salmon approves what they're, they're proposing. And we still don't know if that's going to be the case. We'll know a heck of a lot more in October. Right. So I think the motion. Uh, that was the purpose of the motion. It, expresses a legitimate opinion of uh, members. Um, I haven't heard anything that changes my mind, and I don't want to set the public's mind that there's going to be a change uh, coming in October because people that have talked to me were glad that they could make arrangements early enough to get their children uh, situated in whatever it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, People need time to fix things, and if we make a change on the fly somewhere, even if we could, it's not fair. I think our model was, even when we looked at our hybrid model, was we'd still offer virtual learning anyway. So. Yeah, so our students, we're still bringing small groups of students in anyway. So, yeah, we'll start virtually, but st small groups of students are going to be coming in from the first week. So we'll, we'll never not have students yeah. in. Um, but it's the large masses of students that we can't manage right now because of the regular restrictions that we all face. So I think it needs to be repeated that the virtual plan that we have looked at puts uh, children in the classroom two days off another, then another group comes in on Friday. So basically, children will only be spending two days in the classroom a week in our hybrid model in the hybrid model uh, anybody that proposes we open the schools look at what happened to israel i don't think the proposal was opening the schools 100 percent we're going to look at what's available to high can we incorporate the hybrid model maybe then maybe not can we do the whole thing it's just it was just asking to look at it in the first meeting in october mr smith i have absolutely no problem in discussing this in October to see what changes. What I have a problem with is setting an emotion where we're fixed and dilated on October the 7th because it will get out that we're going to make a change and my, I doubt that we will. So I'm going to weigh on this discussion very quickly. I, I agree we don't need to have a date. I think that we need to look at this every month. I, I, I have looked at the Talbot County model and uh, I you know, congratulate them on what the, how they've done their red, yellow, you know, red, orange, yellow, green days. 
um, to be flexible in their hybrid schedule and, and trying to bring everybody back. And, and I have full confidence in Dr. Kane and the executive team with the principals and everyone involved that we'll be able to do the same thing when we can. I don't like setting a date. I don't want to get people's hopes up that come November, the students are going to be back in school. I, I don't want to give out that false hope. I think that we should review it monthly and we don't really need to have a motion for that because we're going to be reviewing it monthly. I agree. I, I, I mean, you get pigeonholed into a date and a date starts to mean something other than it's just a date to talk. Correct. And if we're going to set an agenda, then we set an agenda. But and I don't know why we would need a, a motion, a vote to set an agenda. Okay. Well, I mean, I think the date is if we're looking at the quarter, which ends in uh, end of October, 1st of November, mm -hmm. the, the, pre, the, board, the board members and the meeting before that, we are going to review it. And I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. It, we, it is what it is today, but we don't know what's going to be in October. And I just think we need to have a thing. Look, this is a thing. If we don't do it by October the 7th, we're not going to be able to do it because we're not going to we can't switch in between quarters then we'd have to go to the next semester i'm just trying to sit there and, and get a time to say let's look at it then we don't know so set your agenda to look at it october the first board meeting in october i mean that that that's what i support but we can take we can vote on it well i mean we've all said what we're going to say about it so can you either can rescind the motion or we'll vote on it i'm not sure what what you're saying Okay. Well, vote on I wanted okay. us to be able to. Yeah, I, I understand. The motion is. Right. Read it again. I'll read it. Okay. Yes. Call for the vote on the motion. Okay. The motion is uh, I move that the board revisit the decision at October the 7th meeting to see if we could move the continuity of learning into a hybrid model starting the second quarter, which is the first week in November. Okay. That's the motion. I call for the vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 Yeah. Noes have it. The motion does not carry. I agree that we should look at it every month. Can, I agree that we, every month we'll put it on the agenda, that we are looking at whether we can go into a hybrid schedule. That way the public will know what we know and we'll all be on the same page. That makes sense. And no false hope. I, I would hope that Mr. Pinder has a sharp pencil to find out how we can cut the cost of the buses doing the hybrid. Well, the cost of a lot of things, sir, because we uh, go to hybrid. We don't even we, know we can do it. We've already discussed this. If we go to hybrid, we have to clean the schools. I made a suggestion to a member. Okay. We all know the whole list of, I mean, we've already gone through it, everything that has to happen from the operations aspect. Anything else you want to add to that? Or is just, <laughs> okay. All right. If I may, I mean, honestly, I think this should be on our agenda for every meeting we have right. from here until because CDC is always coming out with new recommendations and changes and our numbers are changing. I mean, just talk about it every two weeks, I think is prudent. Every meeting and then every, and then every, every work, work session, session. Every meeting, we should be discussing what are the numbers doing, what's the likelihood, so that we're all up to date on the same information. That's a good recommendation. Thank you, Mrs. Morissette. Well, one of the, the the issues we I just didn't want it to, to lay dormant that's all because there is a lot of planning that goes into this hybrid and um, there was a lot of steps that needed to be taken and I just didn't want us to wait until all of a sudden it's November and we're like oh we could have opened but oh the staff is saying we're not ready so that's my goal in, in getting this going is and to if make the sure. staff is not ready when we're reporting we will make sure that you know that the staff is not ready so how would we how would we guarantee that that we just the, said we're going to talk about it every to talk weeks. about it. Okay. Well, what else? Get it reevaluated each month about whether things have changed such that we might want to move in that direction. Is that what you're saying? Don't think that the staff would be doing that. To, no, I, I'm asking a question. You don't think that the Tiger teams and yeah. Dr. Kane I and really, the executive team wouldn't be already looking at that at every week? Well, I think they have. I think they've done an excellent job on presenting these plans, and we're going to go virtual to start with. I think what we're trying to do is sit there and say, there's certain points in our schedule that would be appropriate to change, and one of them would be the quarter. And that's what we're, I'm thinking trying to look at is if we can sit there and do this in a timely fashion. If we're going to get updates every week, every couple of weeks, and talk about everything, then so be it. 
I'm just trying to, you know, but I mean, if we don't, I just think we need to stay diligent on this. I'm not saying everybody's not. I'm just, it's, it's you know, we need to do something. Okay. I don't want to speak out of turn, but I, I, I have full faith that we'll be talking about it at every meeting. Works for me. Okay. Thank you. Um, it is seven o'clock. Does anyone need to take a break? Okay. We are now at public comment and citizen participation again, virtual citizen participation. From Crystal Anders, hi, with proposed plan, how will pre-K be impacted? This is on the reopening of schools. No, 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 are we starting to read? I am going to read, thank you. All of them? I'm going to read what's in my face. Okay. Kathy Gessert, I commend all of your efforts in this difficult process of creating a safe reopening for state staff and students. I truly hope that safety continues to be your priority. I know there are those that are out there voicing full opening demands that are unfortunately only considering a small portion of the many variables that you must consider. If anyone would like to go ahead and close the meeting, I just need three members to close the meeting. There are many parents in QAC who support a safe reopening, whether it is part-time or virtual. The safety for staff, students, and the families that come home to should take precedence and continue to do so until a vaccine is available or the virus is not actively spreading. QACPS plans to reopen, Jillian Page. My name is Jillian Thomas. I have attended QACPS since third grade and currently am an incoming senior at QACHS. I consider that COVID-19 has caused all kinds of kinks in people's plans and the world will change in accordance to that. But as far as reopening plans in the fall, I think the better option is to allow at least the junior and senior classes to attend a closed, a close to normal schedule. These are probably the most important years in our schooling career. As a student who personally does not succeed as well from a distant learning perspective, I'm urging everyone with a say to please reconsider a plan to, how, to allow for high school students who are able to provide their own transportation to and from school to finish their high school year careers as easily and normally as possible. My junior year was impacted greatly. I was unable to take the, a, the ASFAB, SAT, and ACT tests due to the unknown, done to the shut, shutdown. And with the current plan, I'm at risk of losing valuable time before I begin my college journey. I, as well as many other seniors, have the risk of losing valuable internships as well. The younger generations have much more time to recover from this pandemic, where us older students are being hit the hardest. As someone who is able to drive themselves to school, as do almost all other seniors, as well as many in the junior class, the issue of bus transportation diminishes. Again, thank you for letting some, letting some of us with a voice to have a say, but we are the ones who are being impacted the most by this. Monica Young, the input, uh, public input for school 2020-21. To who it can be concern, I am writing on behalf of a soon to be ninth grader and eighth grader who needs physical, t physical teacher interaction. While it is convenient to do online learning for three months, it was not a good thing for our household. My two kids struggle in math, Spanish, and science tremendously. As a working mother and father who deemed essential workers, we absolutely can't take time off from work to help our kids with their schoolwork all day. We both work shift work, a nurse who works 12 hour shifts and a firefighter who works 24 hour shifts. Please consider other working professionals while you consider keeping middle school and high schools school kids home and doing virtual learning all year. Not everyone works a typical nine to five job and the stress of work followed by the stress of homeschooling was destructive to our family dynamics and the relationship with our two kids. We had constant fights about staying on tasks, turning in assignments and being productive. This type of stress has really impacted the kids as well. Not only do I have these two kids, but I have two toddlers, one and two that do not provide a quiet learning atmosphere, let alone allowing me the proper time to help with homework throughout the day when needed. I need my middle and high school students to attend school, school as soon as possible. I would love for a normal five day routine to happen. I can't afford to pay for tutoring for both my children in math class as they have significantly fallen behind in math. They are already stressing about the upcoming year in math. I can't teach them the stuff they are learning currently in advanced algebra. How are these children going to thrive taking online courses? Education is very important in our family and we both want these kids to be successful as they can help to prepare themselves for college. Creating a plan for full-time online learning is a failure for our middle and high school kids. And I'm terrified as a mother that struggles with our family, will it, what our family will enjoy this school year if this is the only option. I'd be reaching out to every possible avenue to make, my kids are, make sure my kids are successful in my son's last year of middle school and my daughter's first year of high school. 
please reconsider this option. We need our teachers. We need the relationships of our teachers. We need the actual physical presence of teaching. Getting our kids back to school as much as possible is so important. Thank you for reviewing and listening to our concerns. Anna, Adam and Monica Young. Plan for reopening in the fall. Becky Brost. Hello to whom it may concern. First of all, let me say that I commend the school board for all the contemplation, concern, effort, and the many hours of thinking through the various health concerns facing our world right now. It is undeniably a very difficult task that you are facing. The education of our children is very important. It is truly a higher calling to serve in education. With that being said, we have to think first about the greatest need of our children right now and our community. Our middle and high school, school children need to go to school in person. This is undeniable. The question then becomes, is, at, is it dangerous for them to do so while there is a virus circulating in our community? No. As it relates to children, all the signs point to not a real danger. The cases of this virus seen in children are few. The transmission of the virus from child to adult is rare. The schools in other countries have returned to in-person learning and have seen much success. I apologize that I didn't see any, didn't cite any good sources for this information as I was trying not to do a research paper at the time. I encourage you though, Google it. There are several reputable sources that would support these findings. It has always been my understanding that with regards to sickness and viruses, the school deals with the problem or potential infection danger when it appears, not before it ever appears. For example, the child who comes to school with a fever and gets sent to the nurse to be checked would then be sent home until the fever is gone for 24 hours. This is the normal approach, even though the child may not have a flu shot or taken precautions ahead of time to stay healthy and may have also infected several students in the morning at school before seeing the nurse and leaving. This has never been the grounds for shutting down in-person learning. Plus, I implore you to investigate and research for yourselves to see that, it, that this virus is no different for our children than the flu. It should not be treated any differently. Finally, I would add, if your reservations about in-school person, in-school person, in-person school are figuring out the schedule that would fit everyone or how to get all the kids on the buses in a distance seating arrangement, please throw out the standard way of doing things and think outside the box. Start from scratch and rework the schedule to find something new. Ask parents to drive their own kids to school. If it means that their kids can attend school, they will surely find a way. The kids need in-person schooling way more than they need the same old scheduling format. They will adjust. Children are very capable of rising to a higher expectation when given a chance. Thank you so much for welcoming comments from parents. We do value to be heard. Please support teachers and students. Richmond, Virginia has the right idea. This is from the Richmond Education Association. We, the Richmond Education Association, would like to state what should be a very non-controversial position on returning to school during a global pandemic. We support a virtual rather than physical return to our school buildings in September. At this present time, it is unequivocally unsafe for us to conduct in-person learning. Research is, is certain that this Ill, illness is airborne and highly contagious, especially indoors. It is unsafe for people to be gathering indoors in large groups at any location. However, it is particularly unsafe to do so in Richmond public school facilities where we have poor air quality systems and open classroom formats. Therefore, we, the push for us is to return to in-person learning at the beginning of the school year amounts to the following statement. We know this is unsafe for staff and students, and we know that some people will die as a result. However, we intend, intend to do so anyway. The rationales provided are the following. Without schools open, the economy will suffer. Without a physical learning environment, the education of our children will be a lower quality. Due to societal inequities of opportunities, not all students will have equal access to learning. Without schools open, the health and well-being of ch children will suffer. Society is telling us that the lives of students and staff are worth a sacrifice for the above. However, we feel that as a society, we are failing to ask the right questions. Why is our entire economy resting on schools as childcare centers? Shouldn't American businesses in the year 2020 have advanced to the point that other countries have where childcare is provided by businesses, long-term parental leave is accommodated, and flexibility in working from home or the school is normal practice? Number two, why have we allowed for an income gap that is so severe and distribution of resources that is so inequitable that we cannot provide on learning to all of our students. Number three, why is it the case that schools ostensibly responsible for education have become the band-aid solution to basic food access and healthcare services to family? Number four, 
Why are our schools so poorly resourced that we can't even fund student and staff needing normal times, needs norm, normal times and don't even come close to having the money to accommodate the adjustments that would be necessary to make partial in-school learning feasible during a health crisis? Number five, if the economy is so hev heavily depends on schools, why are businesses paying tax rates that allow for six figure salaries while schools don't even have functioning air conditioning units? We want to see this crisis prompt serious reflection on the larger structural problems that have been revealed by this plan pandemic. To that end, we are calling on the school board, superintendent, city council, and the mayor to come together to have a discussion focused on what needs to happen for Richmond to be able to weather a health crisis without putting people's lives at risk. We are committed to working together on possible steps, including but not limited to tech training for teachers, a, vi a viable virtual plan for every grade level, working on creating solutions for the entire community. Support of our superintendent, Carlisa Finney. Dear President Harper and members of the Board of Education, I am writing this message to share my support and confidence in, your, in the superintendent, Dr. Andrea Kane, and ask that she be given your support. I also request that this is read on August 5th. More than 50 years ago, Brown versus Brown of Education recognized that providing students with diverse, inclusive educational opportunities from an early age is crucial to achieving the nation's educational and civic goals. In 2011, the Office of Civil Rights provided guidance to school districts citing some, several legal cases to explain and support the idea that racially diverse schools provide an incalculable educational and civic benefits by, by promoting cross-racial understanding, breaking down racial and other stereotypes, and illuminating biases and prejudices. The departmental con communication further recognized that our nation's fear depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to the ideas and, and mores of students as diverse as this nation of many peoples. I've had the privilege and honor of working very closely with Dr. Kane when I was a school board member in 1993 to 2003 and as the director when she was the elementary school principal as she rose in leadership within the Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Fortunately for you, you have an experienced leader who is willing to work, to be, willing to build on work as the board to address any racially dis, 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 disparate outcomes and impacts in access and opportunities for Queen Anne's County students. In addition to the awards she has received for increasing test scores and opportunities in some of the lowest performing schools, she engaged teams at the senior and, ex and executive levels of the district to address system-wide policies, procedures, and practices that contributed to separate outcomes by race socioeconomics. Every effort began with dialogue and resulted in collaborative planning for action. While dialogue and ultimate action can provoke anxiety or discomfort and can be difficult, research shows that engaging all stakeholders, including students, is the most impactful way to ensure equity. I assure you to lean on the experience, skills, and networks that Dr. Kane brings as a district leader to develop strategies, including any dialogue, training, coaching, listening to communities and stakeholders, and planning during this time in our history. She is the right one and deserves your support. I also ask that you resist any fears about the myths and misconceptions of Black Lives Matters. It is not an organization, but a fluid movement that continues to evolve, and it means Black Lives Matter as well, not more. I know the challenges you face and the responsibility you have in supporting and representing the interests of all children and employees in your district. I trust that Dr. Kane is the first you have to have your respect and support. Carly Safini. Sunday Supper Committee of Queen Anne's County started a petition with Commissioner Steve Wilson. We are presenting this petition to support the ongoing efforts to address racism in Queen Anne's County by Dr. Andrea Kane and the Board of Education. This is a direct response to the slander, misinformation, other harmful reactions that have risen in the wake of a call to openly acknowledge and have meaningful dialogue about racism. This call to the humanity of our community to listen more and pass judgment less, be slow to anger and extend grace to one another graciously generously does not warrant the animosity it has received. We are calling on the Queen Anne's County Commissioners to stand with us in deliberate action to acknowledge the presence of racism, denounce the vitriol currently named, aimed at Dr. Kane and other community members, dispel the rampant and misinformation 
being spread online about volunteer effort to coordinate students discussing racism in a facilitated conversation. As parents, students, teachers, alumni, and community members, we stand against this backlash and recognize that we actively work together in love and understanding on this communal education on racism. While others seek to claim racism does not exist in our community, we will continue to work active towards being actively anti-racist. We invite those who have questions, fears, or other discomforts to bridge the divide, to continue working together, to challenge each other towards growth. We acknowledge that we need to do more to build a better, kinder, safer community for everyone of our Queen Anne's County residents, and we will support the efforts to elevate and clearly listen to the voices of students, parents, teachers, staff, and community members in marginalized groups. Dear Queen Anne's County School Board members, our duty as educators and supporters of education is to engage students in conversations about the modern topics of national and global significance of affecting the lives and their futures. Race is not political. No one chooses the color of their skin as they would, as they would choose their party affiliations. Race is only made political when racism is allowed to silence First Amendment rights, legislate inequity, and exploit a justice system in sustaining oppression. Dr. Kane's efforts to bring these conversations to our education community is to be applauded. She has given, she has chosen to give voice to our children by facilitating a path towards understanding both harsh histories and the opportunities for a more equitable future for all. We implore you to consider these recent statements on race by some of those, by some of the many recognized education organizations and curriculum providers that have already been endorsed and are in use in our schools. We are insisting on your public statement for support for Queen Anne's County Schools initiatives, enabling constructive student dialogue around the topics of racism, injustice, and the pursuit of inequity. Christine Bentley. Dear Queen Anne's County School Board members, as longtime member of this community, I believe it is crit critical to engage our students in conversations about issues on national and global significance. To that end, I believe that Dr. Kane's efforts to bring conversation on race to our students should be applauded. Dr. Kane has chosen to give voice to our students and to facilitate understanding both our nation's history and the potential path for more equitable future for all of us. Recent events here in the US and globally show the critical importance of such conversations. For these reasons, I am requesting your support of the Queen Anne's County School initiatives that will enable constructive student dialogue around the topics of racism, injustice, and the pursuit of, inequ uh, pursuit of equity. Dear school board members, as a member of the QAC community, I have to speak up on the issue of race. I have never spoken on this issue before, but after participating in a Graysonville rally for Black Lives Matters and reading Dr. Kane's end of semester letter to parents, I feel inspired to raise my voice. The time is ripe for each of us to examine our own relation to racism. Dr. Kane deserves our deep respect for speaking out about the need for open discussion about race. Her courage is inspiring. We all know in our hearts that healing between the races can only lead to a stronger, better society. Black people want what everyone wants, freedom to make choices that we white people often take for granted, freedom from being assumed guiltily until found innocent, respect. We all want to be treated with respect. It is time we break down the barriers through dialogue. Attending the Sunday suppers is one way that my husband and I participate in this dialogue. In our schools, a shout out to deserve, is deserved to Paul L. Tui, the coach who founded student, Students Talking About Race, STAR. His tools of getting black and white students to share some of the imprints they have about each other's race are something we could all learn from. The Black Lives Matter movement is an invitation for all of us and our institutions to re-examine attitudes and our actions in the realm of race relations. We should welcome this opportunity to examine what is in our hearts and move toward healing. Thank you to Dr. Kane for opening this dialogue, which needs to take place not only in our school, but in every institution, every family in this commun community. Benty Cooney, Graysonville. To all QACPS members, I'm writing in support of Dr. Kane and her efforts to have a community discussion about race. I have known Dr. Kane for 20 years and have the opportunity to work with her in many capacities. During my role as a senior manager of school and family partnerships for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, I relied on her leadership and ability to bring people to consensus on many topics in our county. Our parents and community members valued Dr. Kane's ability to listen to all stakeholders and her unique ability to bring those with differing views together to understand each other's ideas and beliefs. 
Everyone may not have gotten everything they wanted, but everyone walked away with a better understanding of the issues and with a plan that worked for all, always keeping what was best for our students as her guiding light. As our entire country is working toward to open dialogue about race and the impact of racism on our students, teachers, and community, I am sure you know the value of such open and honest discussion. QACPS is very fortunate to have the exact right leader in place at this critical time in history. I urge you to support Dr. Kane and to join her in open dialogue with your community about race. Teresa Tudor. Julie Schaefer. Dr. Kane has my full support as she addresses the issues of race. This is a human issue. Dear members, there has been backlash to Dr. Kane's June 5th letter to parents and I want to add my voice to all the others that are shocked by the effort to misrepresent or misunderstand Dr. Kane's words in that letter. I ask you to consider the nonviolent protests that took place in Queen Anne's County recently. Black and white people in Queen Anne's County marched together in recognition of the mistreatment of and dis discrimination against black people and people of color. It is clear by the simple fact there was no backlash at any of these protests that the people of Queen Anne's County are willing and able to face these issues and can listen more and pass judge less be slow to anger and extend grace to one another great, generously, as Dr. Kane wrote. Our children are the voices of tomorrow. Surely they should be witness to the adults around them listening and extending grace to one another. Dr. Kane has my full support. The Queen Anne's public school system has flourished under her leadership. She is dedicated to the success of our students. Laura Connor. Multicultural education and anti-racism education are vital to humanity. One of Queen Anne's County Public Schools core values is social responsibility. The only way the conditions of our world are going to improve is through communication and education. I am honored to work with Dr. Kane who advocates and strives to support all students. Angela, Angela Bulgaris. Dear Queen Anne's County Board of Education, thank you for taking the time to read this aloud at the board meeting. I'm writing to express my support for Dr. Kane, a Queen, the superintendent of Queen Anne's County Schools. I am aware and have sadly witnessed intense conflict lately regarding a letter written on June 5th by Dr. Kane, in which she championed the need to address and to, to address and end racism. Additionally, there has been disappointing conflict regarding this group, students talking about racism, also known as STAR, at a free event they recently offered to the community. As a parent of children that attend QACPS and a community member, I'm deeply concerned about the backlash I'm observing directly towards Dr. Kane and QACPS for supporting the message that black lives matter. I am also deeply burdened our community's response to a voluntary and free event provided by STAR became controversial and unnecessarily dramatized. When I received Dr. Kane's letter on June 5th, my initial reaction was elation to see another school system speaking up and standing, taking a stand against racism. Soon after, I recall letters I have seen other school systems write regarding their commitment to end racism. I also recall all the very public stances I witnessed businesses and agencies in America take to acknowledge racism and pledge to end systemic racist practices. I thought about how other counties put out letters solely dedicated to expressing their school system stance on racism. At that moment, I worried Dr. Crane's expression of such sentiments need to be shortened and interjected in COVID-19 at the end of your letter because racism is a conscious and unconscious problem in our community and in our schools and the backlash directed towards Dr. Kane would be immense. Unfortunately, I believe I may have been correct. Please let this letter represent my very strong stance in Dr. Kane's let letter addressing Black Lives Matters and working to end racism was more than appropriate. It was critical and that it evidenced in the community's resistance to examining and changing practices that disenfranchise students of color. I also support Black Lives Matters and Dr. Kane. Lastly, in regards to STAR, I have witnessed community upheaval over an event that was voluntary and offered to students via the school messenger system. STAR is a reputable and well-respected local act activist group. We should be embracing and welcoming the opportunities they offer to learn and grow. I'm concerned to have observed a false narrative spread regarding this event including community upheaval, that students were targeted and that a security breach occurred in which student emails were given out. I do not believe any of this to be true and would appreciate the board's publicly clarifying and addressing such accusations made as, it, as to and maintain the integrity of STAR and the community's fight to end racism. Thank you for your time, Ann McCauley. Dear uh, Board of Education members, I'm writing to you to show my support to Dr. Kane and her initiative to get a discussion 
going on racism in Queen Anne's County. Furthermore, I appreciate the I appreciate the email sent by Dr. Keynes addressing racism, Black Lives Matters, and current events in the, our nation. There are students who have shared stories of experiencing racism in our Queen Anne's County public schools. We need to give these students a voice and encourage them to speak up, just as we did with the anti-bullying campaign. Furthermore, we need to to encourage these difficult decisions that we can combat racism in our schools and nation. As a community member, parent, teacher in our county, it is my hope that Queen Anne's County follows suit with other communities in America and continues to educate on anti-racism initiatives as well as encourage these important discussions. Heather Eflint. Dear members of Queen Anne's County, we are writing to you, members of Queen Anne's County Board of Education, we are writing to you as alumni of Queen Anne's County High School and Southersville Middle School to express our support of Superintendent Dr. Kane and the work she is doing for the betterment of Queen Anne's County Public Schools and the community at large. As graduates from the Queen Anne's County School System, my partner and I have often discussed the problematic way in which racism was handled throughout our education. Since graduating and leaving the shore, we have committed ourselves to learning from our past using our privilege for good while continuing to educate ourselves. As white students, we had the privilege not only to think, not to think too deeply about the state of racism in our community during our time within the QAC school system, which is something that we know our fellow black classmates did not have the ability to ignore. Racism is duly rooted in our counties past and present. The Queen Anne's County school system was only desegregated in 1966, and there are still many within our community who went to segregated schools. It is for those reasons, among others, that we are so proud to see the efforts made by Dr. Kane to address these issues through conversations with students and the community, which is honestly all, are long overdue. We are equally, we, we were as equally disappointed to see the backlash Dr. Kane and her efforts received from some in the community. The fact that anyone is questioning the need for discussions about anti-racism, which is voluntary in Queen Anne's County is proof that racism is still alive and well within this community. We implore the members of this esteemed board to consider our county's deep history of racism and understand the ramifications of not supporting Dr. Kane's efforts. Sincerely, Ann and Joe McLaughlin. I still, uh, dear members of Queen Anne's County Board of Education, I support uh, Superintendent Dr. Andre Kane for sending two emails to parents of Queen Anne's County students. A group of residents allege the two emails attached sent to parents of QACPS students are political in nature and are such illegal. They are calling for the termination of Dr. Kane. Neither email nor the link provided mentioned politics. And the first email addresses recent events surrounding George Floyd, the conversations and nonviolent protests that, are, that resulted. In her discussion, she states, as a black woman with two black sons, I worry about uh, being the mother of black sons in America, can understand when I say black lives matter. It is not meant to disparage any other race. It is an acknowledgement of the disparate brutality and overt racism that is only experienced by black people in America, including me. In the July 14, 2020 memo, memo entitled Black Lives Matters and the Hatch Act, U.S. Office of Special Counsel defines political activity as an activity directed toward the success or failure of a political party, candidate for partisan political office or partisan political group. No political party, candidate or group was mentioned in Dr. Keene's email. Dr. Kane's second email was an invitation to middle and high school students to mul in multiple counties to voluntarily join an informal discussion about race hosted by a student organization known as STAR. This group has made a baseless accusation that one of the founders of STAR and facilitators of the discussion is a member of Black Lives Matter's organization because he had stated on his personal Facebook page that Black Lives Matters. This group seems to believe that because our superintendent was one of the facilitators and one of the facilitators are black, they automatically had a political agenda when they say Black Lives Matters when inviting students to speak about race and racism in our community. The memo from the U.S. Office of Special Counsel refer referenced above clearly states that BLM is an umbrella term and there is no official leader of this movement. The memo goes on to assert that BLM Global Network appears to be the most prominent organization whose name's BLM and determines that it is issue an issue advocacy group and is not a partisan political group. In conclusion, they state that BLM, BLM terminology is issue-based, not campaign, not a campaign slogan. Therefore, using BLM terminology without more is not political activity. 
The argument used to call for Dr. Kane's termination is clearly invalid. As a county, we cannot concede to the whims of a small group of people making outrageous and highly inaccurate claims. Dr. Kane has wisely guided us through these unprecedented times while keeping the best interests of our two children as a top priority and focus. We should not be punished because there are, there are people in this county that do not believe black lives matter, really do matter, and ignore the racism within our schools and community. Ashley Cromwell. Dear board members, as a white woman, I am appalled at the racism on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Our children need to be exposed to open dialogue about this issue. Dr. Kame has my full support. I hope your conscience guides you to do the same. Julie Schaefer. Members of the Board of Education, I'm writing this, this with regard to the controversy now surrounding the STAR initiative offered to middle and high school students in Queen Anne's County. I would like to start by introducing myself as a parent whose Japanese American niece was a scholar athlete at QACPS, excuse me, QAHS, who lettered in two sports and was the school mascot during her senior year and graduated with honors. She went on to play volleyball at University of California, Santa Cruz, where she became the first to wear the costume of the school's mascot. Our, our daughter followed as a student athlete and school mascot who volunteered to assist students with disabilities and was a participant in the Empty Bowls Initiative. She too graduated with honors and went on to Towson University where she received her degree in education and became a teacher. They were followed by our foster daughter, a biracial teen who attended Kent Island High School and who after graduation enrolled in a five-year undergraduate program at the University of Maryland College Park followed by a fellowship and subsequent graduation from McGill University in Montreal with a master's in Russian studies. She has since completed a tour with the Peace Corps in Armenia. Anyone who might have asked any one of them if, if racism was unmistakably present in their schools might have rejected but could, have not under, but could not have misunderstood the affirmative answer. My foster daughter is particular, in particular coped. Not every student of color, including others, were equally capable not every student of color, including others, were equally capable did. I respectfully suggest any one of us who believes racism no longer exists in Queen Anne's County is not looking far enough nor deeply enough. This is worrisome. There are those among who know racism exists and despite this knowledge use insidious and disarming appeals to denigrate legitimate and thoughtful efforts to foster cross-racial and cross-cultural bridges to protect the status quo. This is worrisome. Those who identify STAR as a political movement inspired by Marxism are promulgating untruths, ironically in service of their own very visible political agenda and politicized actions. I'm asking you to look deeper at the roots, nature, and purpose of any organization that uses castigation, deception, and fear to usher others away from initiative that has the potential to lead to a greater understanding of societal factors, dividing our communities, and perpetuating discriminatory conduct, even though it may be unintentional. Not only do our children of color deserve this, but our white children deserve it too. Racism in Queen Anne's County is not limited to our schools, but addressing it in our schools is a good place to start. I'm calling upon the school board to stand openly with the superintendent to, in support of learning process that can foster cross-racial understanding among the generation that will become parents, business owners, public servants, and leaders in our community. Thank you, Jim and Diane McComb. Dear members of the Board of Queen Anne's County Public School System, on behalf of the North American Association for Environmental Education, we are writing today to express full throated support for the leadership of Dr. Kane as Superintendent of Public, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. <clears throat> we were disappointed and angered to hear a small but vocal movement to have Dr. Kane terminated in the wake of her June 5th letter to parents and guardians. Dr. Kane's communication to students and family regarding systemic racism and her call for student dialogue and the impacts of racism in our school and communities reflect her excellence as an educator and leader during difficult and unprecedented times. Moreover, her words and actions in keeping with those of other educational leaders throughout Maryland and across the country. On June 3rd, the AASA, the Superintendent's, uh, School Superintendents Association, issued a statement that reads, in part, we are living at a time of obscene inequities and merely trying to compensate is not enough. Equity is more than making is more than making things more accessible and AASA's work on equity must go further and become actively anti-racist. The perpetual traumas 
of inequity and discrimination manifest as more than acts of the more than acts themselves, taking a significant toll on the mental health and well-being of those impacted. Now is the time for our educational leaders to intensify our commitment to address inequities and work to dismantle systemic racism. Leading a system-wide system effort requires that we ensure that cultural responsiveness permeates all levels of the district, from teaching and learning to busing and building, to all levels of professional development and community engagement. We need a nonstop commitment to ensure that students leave their schools fully prepared to succeed in a society that is ever more racially, ethnically, and socioeconomically diverse. In a June 8th letter to the community, to the education community, Maryland State Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Salmon wrote, as an educator, I know that our children are looking to see how adults react and respond. We must begin by being accountable as leaders for our youngest and often most vulnerable members. Therefore, I want to add my voice to the realization that we have a moral imperative as educators to condemn racism and policies that perpetuate it. Dr. Kane is the co-chair of the NAAEE Superintendent's Environmental Education Collaborative and serves on the board of the NAAEE affiliate, the Maryland Association of Environmental and Outdoor Education. She is highly regarded as a leader in education excellence throughout Maryland and nationally. QACPS should be proud of Dr. Kane's commitment to speak out against the norms of systemic racism, to be an example of what it means to stand up for what is right, and to create much more needed space for students to come together for difficult conversations and to pave the way for a brighter and more just future. She should not stand alone. We stand with her and urge the Board of Education to do the same. Judy, Bra Judy Bross. Dear members of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, we the Board Directors, Advisory Council and Staff of the Maryland Association of Enter and Environmental and Outdoor Education write to you today in support of Dr. Andrea Kane. We recognize Dr. Kane as one, just one of Maryland's finest education leaders, but also for the national recognition that she brings to our state and to Queen Anne's County. She was a leader connecting the achievement of, the achievement of our students with environmental practices for a sustainable future for our children. You are being applauded around the state for what you have done in education and by achieving 100% participation in the Maryland Green Schools program. Your district is the second in the state of Maryland to achieve this standard. Governor Hogan and Dr. Salmon, MSDE um, superintendent, recognize the green school efforts that represent a school-wide commitment to environmental literacy that includes staff, students, and the community. Even when not physically in school buildings, we can all continue to serve as role models in the community, says Dr. Salmon. Dr. Kane has recently been named to the MAEOE Board of Directors in recognition for her leadership in Queen Anne's County. We recognize and support her practical experience and the educational vision that brings her to work, brings, that she brings to her work and to the MAEOE. Respectfully, Laura Collard. Dear Queen Anne's County Board of Education members, I am borrowing much of the eloquence previously shared with you by another QACPS educator on the front lines of advocacy for our children, Christine Bentley. She shared with you that our duty as educators and supporters of education is to engage students in conversations about the modern topics of national and global significance affecting their lives and their futures. Race is not political. No one chooses the color of their skin as they would choose their party affiliations. Race is only made political when racism is allowed to silence their First Amendment rights legislates inequity and exploit a justice system in, in sustaining oppression. Dr. Kane's efforts to bring these conversations to our education community is to be applauded. She has chose, chosen to give her voice to our children by facilitating a path towards understanding both harsh histories and the opportunities for a more equitable future for all. We are insisting on your public statement of support for Queen Anne's County Public Schools initiatives enabling constructive student dialogue around the topics of racism, injustice, and the pursuit of inequity. Dr. Rebecca Perry. Dear uh, members of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, it has come to the attention of the Queen Anne's County NAACP that it's some residents of Queen Anne's County are seeking the resignation of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Andrea Kane. After examining Dr. Kane's performance, we have seen nothing to warrant at resignation. She has put forth certain course content and program initiatives which lead to all students' overall understanding of life situations and therefore they are better prepared for the next level of development. Additionally, her leadership in the necessary adjustments brought on by COVID-19 is exemplary. Queen Anne's County NAACP strongly supports Dr. Kane in her efforts to provide a well-rounded education for all students of Queen Anne's County. Mr. L.C. Lawrence. 
Dear board members, of, uh, Queen Anne's County board members, my name is Christy Russell. I am a long re longtime resident of Queen Anne's County and a parent of three incredible young men. I write today to express my unwavering support of Dr. Kane as the superintendent of schools. Recently, I was asked by a black friend what grade I was in when I had my first black teacher. The answer was never. While I did, grow, did not grow up in Queen Anne's County, I know that we are marred with a similar shortage of professional people of color in our community. From the U.S. Department of Education website, a growing body of research, research shows that diversity in schools and communities can be a powerful lever leading to positive outcomes in school and in life. Racial, racial and socioeconomic diversity benefits communities, schools, and children from all back, backgrounds. Today's students need to be prepared to succeed with a more diverse and more global workforce than ever before. Research has shown that more diverse organizations make better decisions with better results. By retaining a minority woman in power, we are better poised to ensure that our children do not encounter my same fate an entire school career without a single black teacher or professor. While criticism of Dr. King grows in our community, it is imperative that we look at the merit of her achievements to judge her efficiency in her role. The graduation rate in our county grew from 92 to 96 percent in the last five years. Our county ranks among the top 20 percent of all school districts in Maryland. Additionally, she firmly stands in the face of adversity and remains a constant advocate ensuring all students access a free and appropriate public, ed public school education. Do not allow the voices of the loud and persistent to taint the evidence before you. Queen Anne's County is lucky to have the professional, steady, compassionate, epi empathetic, and strong leadership of Dr. Andrea Kane, Christy Russell. My name is Kathleen Mensch, a resident of Chester, Maryland. I am an educator in a neighboring county and have a son who attends elementary school in Queen Anne's County. I am writing this letter in support of Dr. Andrea Kane. As a teacher of nearly 20 years in an urban school, I was hesitant about my son attending a school in an area that lacked diversity in both his classroom and his educators. However, I was heartened to feel the welcoming swell of warmth from his school community. Thusly, I was extremely disheartened to see the uproar in the community about Dr. Kane's letter to the community early June. During that time of national shock and outrage at the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor, leaders in cities and community Cities and communities, large and small, were speaking out against the systemic racism that continues to plague our nation. Dr. Kane dared to utter the three words, Black Lives Matter. Those words, which seem so simple to so many, have become deemed an anathema. I think I can never say that word. Anath anathema? Yeah, there you go. To a small yet highly vocal group of our residents. Ultimately, one has to wonder why these two sen those two sentences in Dr. K Kane's letter evoked such a vitriolic response. Dr. Kane, in many ways, was echoing the words of Dr. Uh, State Superintendent Karen Salmon, who wrote in her letter to educators across Maryland, we have a moral imperative as educators to condemn racism and policies that perpetuate it. Other counties in the state have led man mandatory systemic professional developments on racism and bias. Some have educators participating in, actively, in active professional learning communities on topics such as racial inequity and inclusion in curriculum development and classroom management. For Dr. Kane to merely acknowledge the current trends both in and out of the classroom should not be considered controversial. It should be, con should be mandatory for one in her position. As noted by James Baldwin, the paradox of education is precisely this, that one begins to be become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. And let us not forget the achievements of Queen Anne's County Public Schools according to the Maryland State 2018-2019 report card. Our county boasts a 95% graduation rate as well as proficient academic achievement in every student group. Dr. Kane's strong and steady leadership has steered the growth and fostered student excess, success in our county. The proof is in the data. In Queen Anne's County, we are so fortunate to have a superintendent of schools that leads with strength, compassion, professionalism. My hope is that the community recognizes how truly fortunate we are to have her at the helm and we are steadfast in our support for this dynamic educator, Kathleen Lynch. Dear members of the Board of Education, my name is Lisa R. Grant. I write this letter for one primary reason, to support Dr. Andre Kane and all her efforts to prompt behavioral and attitude, attitude mm, and excuse me. I got it. And change. We need a collective force to uproot something so historical and so deep as the weed of racism. 
In order to change the behavior of a society, we must change policies. If you don't have policies that enable you to speak out and stand up against racism, you need to create the policies and release your fear, allegiance, and status quo to govern them in Queen Anne's County Public Schools and wherever this despicable behavior is demonstrated. From your neighbors to your realty firms, to your restaurants, to your healthcare facilities, to your farms, and starting here in your schools. If you see something, say something. To say nothing means you are in support of the ugly behaviors that are dem demonstrative of dis discrimination, separati separatism, degradation, and racism. When you see behaviors, practices, and age-old customs that are demonstrative of ignorance as advocates for all children, you have the moral responsibility to speak up. Your role is to write the policies to support the vision of ensuring that all graduates of Queen Anne's County Public Schools are well-educated, globally competitive, and prepared to become caring, productive citizens in the 21st century. It is a visionary to think beyond the confinement caused by shackled fear. It takes a visionary with compassion to enforce policies that would provide world-class excellence to all students. It takes a visionary to prepare students for a socially evolving, competitive society. And quite frankly, Dr. Kane is that visionary. Support Dr. Kane in all her efforts to ensure that Queen Anne's County Public School students are highly successful. Support Dr. Kane in all her efforts to produce intelligently, physically, emotionally, and socially prepared graduates. The Queen Anne's County School Board. In this day and age, Dr. Andre Kane, Superintendent of Public Schools, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, wants to have an open forum with students and parents to express their feelings about what is going on in the world today. I do not understand why anyone want such a positive event not to happen. Dr. Kane does not only care and represent the black and brown students, she cares and represents all students regardless of their color, creed, or economical background. I think that what I think what she wants is to do to do is all for the best of her students and families. It is unfortunate that our few people thinking on the lines of selfishness rather than supporting Dr. Kane and the change that she wants to continue to make. Please let our black and brown students know that you support them, even though all lives matter. Black lives are the ones that are being oppressed. All students need to feel safe, secured, va and valued and respected in their school environment. Thank you in advance for consideration of reading my letter. Sabrina Booker. Oh, I already read this one. I read, I read that one. Members of the Queen Anne's County Public, uh, Queen Anne's County School Board, I am writing support of your superintendent, Dr. Andre Kane, in her initiative to create a dialogue about racism with the students of your school system. You're extremely fortunate to have a consummate education professional leading your school district in general, but most especially at this crossroad in time where racial injustice has come to the forefront of our national, con national conscience more emphatically than in any time in the last 50 years. I worked with Dr. Kane as a member of the executive team for Richmond Public Schools, Virginia, prior to her appointment to your school district. I know Dr. Kane's passion and compassion for nurturing and creating opportunities for all students. She leads by example. She is a supportive leader, believes in diversity, and treats everyone with respect. You're extremely fortunate to have her experience to lead a critically timed discussion with your students about race reflection. It would be irresponsible to ignore a current state, to ignore a current event that is so deeply reverberating throughout through our con entire country. It would be folly to believe that your students will be unaware or unaffected by the events of today. You have the perfect leadership to hold a constructive dialogue about race and for each student to reflect on what racism means to them. While 19% of your school district is identified as ethnic minorities, it is even more critical for the 81% to contemplate and having meaningful dialogue about racism. There is an opportunity to advance the dialogue that has been slowly evolving since the founding of our country. There is an organization in your country that describes itself the race self-reflection event as a Marxist ideology driven attempt to ra radicalize your children and promote racial division. Now that hypocrisy of the that's hypocrisy of the first order. How do you label an event designed for open dialogue to share ideas and work towards understanding and universal acceptance of your fellow humans as an event that is designed to divide? Some local individuals in your community posted a statement describing the Black Lives Matters as a radical. I urge you to visit, if you have not, the BLM site, www.blacklivesmatters. Read the about section and what we believe section, wherein the last sentence clearly encapsulates the purpose. 
We embody and practice justice, liberation, and peace in our engagements with one another. Do we not all want that for ourselves and everyone we know? It is sad to think that is a radical notion. There has to be recognition that the experience of black children in this country on an average start at a different disadvantage in resources due to hundreds of years of systemic racism. The recent highly publicized series of murders of black men and women has made it impossible to ignore the inhumanity. The entire world has taken notice and is demanding a response leading to improvement. There could be no better time to have an important discussion led by a superintendent who cares about every one of your children. I would hope that each of you would be vocal in supporting this effort, which will demonstrate that you too care about every one of your students. Ralph West Bay. Dear board members, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, we are writing this letter in wholeheartedly solidarity and support of Dr. Andre Kane and her efficiency as not only a school district leader, but also a leader in the field of racial and social equity, diversity, and inclusion. We've had the privilege of working in your school district over the past three years in the capacity of equity consultants, leading training for not, not only all your site and district administrators, but also working closely with your school district staff at eight of your school sites as they build on their internal capacity to do the work of equity. Equity work takes boldness and courage on the part of all involved. And we have seen that courage every day. We have seen that courage day in and day out in the teachers and school leaders, which we've engaged. They've dug into their own beliefs and practices and worked hard to shift school and classroom practices in order to more inclusively meet the needs of all students that, their, that your district serves each and every day. As part of this work, we have also worked closely with Dr. Kane. And in doing so, we can speak firsthand to her professionalism and consistent concern in both words and actions for the needs of all the students she serves each and every day. She leads with compassion and deep vision for making good on the promise of public education. And she does this in a community that does have a deep history, like most communities throughout the United States, of racial and social inequity. Equity work at its core is about ensuring that all students have access to learning environments that are safe, supportive, and welcoming. Yet in order to achieve this end, we know that oftentimes we have to privilege, privilege the needs of those who have traditionally marginalized or disenfranchised by the system in order to achieve equitable outcomes. Dr. Kane's work this spring that appears to have come under question by a select group in your community was very much in line with how equity work looks in practice when it is done with integrity, vision, and courage. In a nation that claims to believe in educating all children to become engaged citizens, Dr. Kane's consistent leadership, leadership represents a desire to put systems in place to make good on that promise. Her actions this spring in the wake of George Floyd's killing and all the racial unrest that ensued were no exception. Without a question, we stand in wholehearted support of Dr. Kane and her leadership, uh, Dr. Marina Gilmore and Dr. Lamar Shields. Dear members of the Board of Queen, Queen Anne's County School Board, this letter is, is, of communication is in support of Dr. Andre Kane and the Board of Education's petition, petition to address racism in Queen Anne's County. As an educator and parent and grandparent, I strongly feel that it is time to have a courageous conversation about racism and the negative impact it has on equality and productivity in our communities and our schools. As a former resident and former parent from a Queen Anne's County Public School, I consider it imperative that we get, begin this dialogue immediately. Research has proven that students who have support, have the support, encouragement, and trust of their parents and community perform better in school and in life. Research by Brendan O'Keefe, 2011, in his report, Our Five Steps to Better School Community Collaboration, Simple Ideas for Creating Stronger Network. As in stated in the old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. One could imagine that it would take a community to nurture a school. We need to work as a community to cultivate our schools for our particular community needs. I believe the answer to real education slash school transformation is strong, authentic community connections and actions. When families, community groups, business, and school schools band together to support learning, young people achieve more in school, stay in school longer, and enjoy the, enjoy the formal learning experience more. Listed below are the themes for successful, for successful school transformation to emerge. Community and business school partnerships, parental collaboration, curriculum connected to real world experiences, student voice, 
cross-generation learning, locals, designing solutions to local problems, as stated by Ryan Bretag. One of the best ways to connect and create an authentic bond is to go to the people who matter most and meet them on their own level where they are in life. A series of community talks will be a great way to start. As suggested by Dr. Andre Kane, we need to share ideas and principles to enhance community school partnerships by asking stakeholders what matters to them. Further, ask them how they might help and show them the compassion, show the passion QACPS has for creating a comfortable education system that also recognizes the feelings of black and brown children. The plan should include the delivery of an open invitation to reconnect, collaborate, and share their experience, skills, and time to make a difference in black and brown children's educational environment. As an educator, parent, grandparent, and advocate for change, for a more positive atmosphere in our schools, change will not occur unless we address race relations and racism head on and stop denying its existence in our schools. As citizens, we need to stop turning a blind eye to what's playing out in our communities right before us. If not, we are going to find ourselves creating additional unfair and unequitable events, creating deeper rooted problems and avoiding the reality of our present condition. Dr. Audrea Kane is presenting a tremendous opportunity for all stakeholders in Queen Anne's County to have a seat at the decision-making table to support community change and positive relations throughout. As stated by the late Congressman John Robert Lewis, you must be bold, brave, and courageous and find a way to get in the way. This means the Queen Anne's County Board of Education and community leaders should take a seat at the discussion table and help to craft policies and make changes that will facilitate an equitable learning environment for all children. It is this writer's opinion that it is much easier to address the problem facing black and brown children, as well as their questions and concerns that are in front of us, rather than, rather than allowing our children to feel as if no one cares. Thank you in advance for reading this. Veronica Williams. Nothing else? Adding anything else? Do I have a motion to close the open session? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments, or on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to close the open session. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Good evening. Mm -hmm.